Hi everybody, uh, my name is Francis Ren Fernandez uh, and today I will be discussing a subject that I've been thinking about all my life from high school. It's how matter comes out of the so-called ether. So here is um, a statement uh, about what Nikola Tesla uh, had said in his paper, Man's Greatest Achievement, describing the concept of ether and also that this ether is the substance into which all of matter will eventually fall or dissolve into, as we chemists say. Ten years ago, at the University of New Mexico, um, David D. Elster linked me up when I was in India, and it was one of two of the first live video conferences. I was the first to go, and this is what I presented then. Since then, it's ten years, and I find myself physically present here, which is great. So David, um, at that time, Bob Easton, he listened to me and he emailed me this statement. He said you took a very imaginative, intuitive, and coincidental step in correlating Newton's equation with Coulomb's equation. And by canceling out terms and known constants, I got this mass of 1.86 times 10 to the power minus 9 kilograms. Now the reason why I did that was I said, if I have to get to the root of what's common to all of mass in the universe, then there must be some equality between the electric, electromagnetic charge and, and magnetism with the gravitational uh, force fields. And I got this number, which I call the ether particle. So if everyone uh, uh, stays with me, the mass of ether is 1.86 times 10 to the power minus 9 kilograms. So I put that value into Newton's equation. We know g, we know the mass of ether, we know c squared. So what is b? And that turned out to be 1.38 to the power minus 36. And that is the radius of ether. So the mass of ether is known. The radius of ether is known. And as we get along this talk, you'll find that I deconstructed the speed of light squared as 3.48 times 10 to the power 12 meter per second and 25812.8 meter per second. So C square is not C times C, but rather one faster than light component and one slowed component. How I arrive at that will follow. Now this force of the 186 ether turns out to be 1.2 times 10 to the power 44 newtons. It was this number that grabbed Bob Easton's uh, attention, and he had arrived and, at this same number, and he called it the super force. And that's when he emailed me back, and he said, you achieved this very quickly, and it was just three steps that I did it, where mc square is known, and, and r is known, so we get force. And I say here that the gravitational force is not the weakest, but the strongest force in nature, 10 to the power 44 newtons. Furthermore, he said this super force is C4 by G and is an inverted form of Einstein's field equations in GRT. Now, Max Planck had come up, and this is in standard physics textbooks, with the Planck length and Planck scale. And I got the fit. If I put my 186 ether radius on the left side and multiply it by 137, which is the inverse of the hand of God coined by Feynman, lo and behold, you get the Planck length. So the right hand side is the Planck length and mass. The left hand side is my 186 ether. And the reason why we have uh, these two equalities is the inverse of the hand of God 137. 
Feynman said whoever solves this will have solved one of the deepest mysteries in the universe. So it is basically a pulsation where the 186 ether is the lower pulsate limit and the Planck length and mass is the upper pulsate limit. And this pulsation is at the heart of the universe. If you do a simple ratio and proportion, the 1.86 ether has a radial length of 1.38 times 10 to the power minus 36 meters. So I said, let's check out what will be the mass in one meter. And it is 1.34 times 10 to the power 27 kilograms. So we have 10 to the power 27 kilograms in one radial meter of space. And this is the distribution of ether in the universe. Now you can test this and I'll give experimental evidence that this works. Having worked those out, I restated that in a different way. So if M is 186 ether, 1.86 times 10 to the power minus 9 kilograms, and radius is 1.38 times 10 to the power minus 36, then M times R times 10 to the power 7 equals elementary charge squared. So I got that fundamental unit of electric charge. So we think of an electron always as elementary charge. An electron is just one type of photon. So if we put the mass of an electron there, 9.11 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms, and its radius, which is 2.81 uh, uh, times 10 to the power minus 15, you will get elementary charge. So this is a very powerful equation that relates charge square, elementary charge square, with mass and radius. You can put the proton mass and its radius, and you can arrive at charge square. Or any fundamental particle whose mass is known, you can get r, its radius. Furthermore, once you know r, you can work out its wavelength, which is 2 pi r times 137.036. All this is experimental. Or, reversibly, if you know the wavelength, you can work out R, and from R, you can work out mass. So, you have a particle and a wave, both being described by two very powerful equations that I have now constructed. The field is M upon R, as worked out per meter, 1.3.466 times 10 to the power 27 kilograms per meter. Feynman had spoken on the hand of God in his book, and he said this is the most profound and beautiful equation associated with the observed coupling constant, E. And he talks about 137.036, and about uh, the fact that all good theoretical physics, physicists put this number up on their wall as a worry. It is related to pi, or perhaps something based on the natural logs, he says. The hand of God wrote this number, and we don't know how he pushed the pencil. Well, I've shown that that 137, which is the inverse of the hand of God number, is basically uh, the radius of the 186 ether, which then gives the Planck length. And so, he says, we don't know what kind of dance this does in the universe. Now, the gamma factor, which was discussed yesterday, which is one uh, minus v squared by c squared. So once I knew that 137 is the pulsation factor, I said, let's see what happens if I divide speed of light c by 137 and treat it as v. And, and I get 0.9946748. When I multiply that with an electron as a test particle, which is 9.109 times 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms, and I subtract that, uh, that new mass from the original electron mass, I get 2 times 2.2425, which is uh, the Rydberg photon. Why I call it the Rydberg photon, two Rydberg photons, is because if I do MC lambda and I use de Broglie's equation, um, it works out to wavelength, the inverse of which is the Rydberg number, which is observed in spectra. So here I have shown with certainty something very powerful. And, and here, Feynman says, uh, here Feynman says that he knows that 
a real electron emits and absorbs photons, and he draws that in his Feynman diagrams, but no one has put numbers until now, and I put numbers to it and made it happen. So over here you have your two uh, Rydberg photons, which are two times the Rydberg mass, times R, using the charge square, and R turns out to be the Bohr radius. So the Bohr radius, normally we think of as the radius of the hydrogen atom. I've shown over here with certainty that the Bohr radius is nothing but two photon masses, 10 to the power minus 35 kilograms, which are formed because of the pulsation of an electron mass by 137. So the hand of God number in verse 137 reveals how this process takes place experimentally. This is not a thought, this is not a derivation, this is not an idea, but an exp everything that I've said from slide one until the end will be all experimental. So we have MC lambda there, and if you plug in uh, the mass of a Rydberg photon, you get lambda, the inverse of which is the Rydberg number, which is there in atomic mass spectra. And that's what's depicted in this slide. So you have charge square giving R, which is the pore radius. Plug in R over here, and you get the wavelength. The inverse is the Rydberg number, which is in the SI or Kodata booklets. Back again to to Newton's gravity. So you, you put in, again, the radius of ether, the mass of ether, and C squared, and you get G here. Now I want to show you how ether contributes to Earth's gravity. So ether over here is 8.57 times 10 to the power 33 kilograms for Earth. So all I did was a simple ratio and proportion. If 1.34 times 10 to the power 27 kilograms of ether occupies one radial meter, how much ether will be contained in the radius of the Earth? The radius of the Earth is 6.371 times 10 to the power 6 meters. That turns out to be 10 to the power 33 kilograms of ether. And I said, let's see what happens when you mass times acceleration. So I put the mass of ether, 9.82 as the acceleration due to gravity. I get this force of 10 to the power 34 newtons, which is basically what balances out the force of the Earth mass of Earth times C squared upon R. And if you work out for R, it is the mass of the Earth. Put in, in a different way, mass of Earth times C squared equals mass of ether times V squared. So what I've shown for certain is that the ether, which is the unknown quantity in mc squared equals m, mv squared, gives us acceleration due to gravity. And these are very big numbers, 10 to the power 33. So it is correct. So the gravity of Earth is caused by ether. And I've done it very simply over here. And uh, what is so intriguing is that I spent about two years and I put mass of Earth with v squared because I thought v squared upon r is 9.8. And so I multiply that with mass of Earth. But then I found that mass of Earth and c squared made the equation work. And that struck me and I said, oh, we are already at light speed. All of us are already at light speed. It's not that we are at a slower velocity v. So then if we are already at light speed, let us see how is that so. And I'm coming to the point which will answer many questions that uh, the difference between this velocity at which trains and cars move and hydrogen and molecules move versus speed of light c squared. So these are three equations with an electron as a test particle. So in these three equations, what we see is Einstein's equation, Coulomb's equation, and Newton's equation. And they all give the same amount of energy. So we were told in school and college that Newton's equation work on the galactic scale, but not on the atomic scale. Well, I've decided to break that that idea and show that it works at the atomic scale, in this case for an electron. And the reason why it works is because I put 186 ether here. So when you put 186 ether 
it works. And that is a, a classic definition of how we have got it wrong because we put wrong numbers in wrong uh, formats in equations. This is a very powerful experiment which proves how velocity actually works. So whenever we are talking about uh, relativity or, or velocity or speed of light, we really don't know what we are seeing in terms of what these velocities mean and to what masses they are attributed to. So this will clearly tell us the difference between the different velocities. So over here you have mass of hydrogen at a velocity of 1927 squared. And this 19.27 square is the root mean square velocity of hydrogen in, in, um, in a system of gas uh, in a tank at 300 Kelvin. That is equal to mc square. So that's at uh, the velocity measured in a tank uh, at 300 Kelvin. And the mass of the, what I call the temperature photon because it's at 300 Kelvin, mc square. And then I put the mass of ether, which is 186, which gives me v squared, the velocity of the ether. And 3k300 is the right hand side of the ideal gas equation, where k is the Boltzmann's constant. And hf is the energy by Planck's equation, where h is the Planck's constant. And f is frequency. Now, I've brought together Newton's gravitational constant, ideal gas equation, uh, the kinetic theory of gases, mc squared and ether velocity all on one slide. So G can be deconstructed as R upon M, where R is the radius of ether, 1.38 10 to the power minus 36. The temperature photon mass is from mc square. And then v square is actually taken from ether. So as in the mass of Earth times c square, mass of ether times v square, the velocity due to acceleration is due to ether and not due to anything else. But here I've shown the real reason for velocity squared in a gas tank of hydrogen. So the radius of hydrogen is 7.67 times 10 to the power minus 19 meters for the molecule using the charge square equation. And the radius of, of the temperature photon, 1.3 10 to the power minus 37, turns out to be 1.85 10 to the power minus 8 meters. The square of the temperature photon, the square of the temperature photon and, and the radius of that and times the radius of hydrogen, R square, divided by time, which is the inverse of frequency here, gives 1927 square. So what I have shown through a simple experiment is that the velocity of a particle, in this case a hydrogen molecule, is due to two masses and not due to one mass. The first mass is the mass of the hydrogen molecule and the second mass is that of a temperature photon which is in the ether. And that's the driving force. There are two masses involved in acceleration, V squared, 1927.31 squared. And this fact has been ignored when people are doing relative equations where we're showing rectilinear motion. Because that rectilinear motion, V, it is not a depiction of acceleration. Acceleration is due to two masses, one of the ether mass carrying this temperature photon and matter mass, which is hydrogen. So this is a huge, huge find. Here's the super force which I call the ether force, 1.21 times the power 44 newtons. And it can be derived, uh, uh, I mean, we can use that to find out the meaning of the term V or voltage. Ether mass is 186 10 to the power minus 9. The radius 1.38 10 to the power minus 36. Speed of light 2.998 10 to the power 8 meter per second. I do a simple operation. I take electron volts, EV, and I divide it by E. So I need an E cancel, you get V. And we know that EV, E in joules equals mc square. So either force equals mass times acceleration. I know the force, uh, uh, 1.21 10 to the power 44 newtons. I know the mass, 1.86 times 10 to the power minus nine. I get acceleration. 
Acceleration equals c squared by r. c squared is known, r is known. So I've shown that this term v, which I call voltage, is actually acceleration. I've shown this for to be true even for uh, an electron. So EV of an electron is 511 keV. If you divide that by 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19, it will be equal to c squared upon r. Now this equation, all these things which I am showing you on each slide, surrounds the parameters that define the reality, which is the ether and its interaction with the material universe. So Q square is E square times 8.6 10 above minus 5. Q is equal to the Boltzmann constant. So the Boltzmann constant was, is actually 1.38 times to the power minus 23. And this term turns out to be 1.3795 times to the power minus 23. I have a more accurate descriptor of the Boltzmann's constant. And Boltzmann at that time didn't have the equipment to test. He had his accuracy to three digits. I have an accuracy to minus 36 digits. So uh, I, I think that this value is, is more, very, very much more accurate. So there are two precessions which take place with, uh, with charge square, what we call elementary charge square. And they are here. And how do I get these two precessions? I got this by solving the ideal gas equation and deconstructing Boltzmann's constant under paper, the solution to the Boltzmann's constant. And I got a feedback from one of the N NPA members, which is then NPA three years ago, and he called it a masterpiece. And I think that this was one of the best papers I wrote because I, I got the three volumes, three lengths that give volume of a gas uh, at a particular temperature. So energy E is equal to this term here, which is the Boltzmann's constant, 2 pi 10 to the power minus 7, 137 times E. So you can see this precession factor. This precession factor carries out in all of physics, including angular momentum and and uh, electron, uh, the Bohr magneton, and energy in terms of uh, cyclotrons. And Ea, I've changed voltage to acceleration. This is Ev by the old term, but V is acceleration, Ea. And I've shown that Ea or e Ev is actually absolute Kelvin temperature. This is another fine. So I have defined temperature as Ea or Ev. This is very huge because it has applications and patterns in terms of, of ablation of cells using radio frequencies because you know what temperature you can attain through electron volts or EA acceleration. So here's the solution of the Boltzmann constant and that answers your question on pressure of ether. I've solved that. Uh, current square over here, as you will see in, the, in another experiment on the next slide, is force. R1, R2 are the two lengths I found out through the Boltzmann constant. So force upon area is pressure. So this is your ether pressure. R1, R2, R3 are the three lengths involved in the ether uh, and, and the material world that give us volume of a, of, an, of a gas under ideal conditions. This is the precession factor, and this is Ea or Ev, which is temperature. So I've deconstructed the ideal gas equation in terms of pressure, volume, precession, and temperature. There is an error in, in our understanding here because of electron volts. We treat electron volts as energy, but actually this E, E, V, E is energy. So the bracket should be here, and this is a precession factor. But I kept it the old way because it will give you the answers. So force upon area times volume, pressure volume is energy, precession times energy. This is the correct way of depicting the ideal gas equation. Atmospheric pressure is force upon area I square R1, R2. So since this was done at 300 Kelvin, the pressure turned out to be 1.01 times 10 to the power 5 Pascals. So that answers the question of either pressure. It's solved already. So this is the charge square, just as a reminder that ether, 186 ether, is elementary charge. Now, electric current. 
we all think of as motion of electrons. But in, in my entire understanding and study, I found no evidence for this. It may still be true, but I find no evidence that electrons carry electricity. In fact, I have absolute experimental evidence in four papers, the water heater experiment, the, the experiment using a copper wire, electrolysis of water, a 10th grade experiment, and this, this uh, uh, slide depicted here, that ether and matter in co combination uh, is electricity. So it is very simple. This is the formula. Current I equals MV divided by E where M could be a proton mass or a copper atom mass. So it's electrolysis of water, H plus mass, 1.67 times, times 10 to the power minus 27 kilograms, times V, which is the velocity of that proton in water, which can, can be measured, and divided by elementary charge, 1.602 times 10 to the power minus 19 kilograms. Gives you I on an ammeter. So the ammeter is known, mass of a copper atom or ion is known, elementary charge is known, you find V. V is equal to R upon T. R can be gotten from charge square equals MR. And T is the time taken for that ion to discharge at, in this case, a cathode because it's an H plus, uh, the cation to discharge at a cathode. And so if you know that there's X amount of atoms depositing in so much time. You divide the total time by the number of atoms that are discharged, and lo and behold, you will get T, which is R upon T. And so I have conclusively shown that elect electricity is the motion of atoms or ions and not electrons by a simple formula, I equals MV by T, where MV by E, where V equals R upon T, and T is the time on the clock. So all experimental numbers. There is no motion of electrons in the conduction of electricity. I have redefined electric current. In this case, I have shown, because ethers involved, that electric current can also be depicted as 1.86 times 10 to the power minus 9 times V divided by E, where V is the velocity of ether. And then if you combine the ether and the matter, in this case, hydrogen ions or copper or whatever, uh, which is conducting the, uh, showing the electric current on an ammeter, then you can use the term CV. And I know Virus Fernando will be familiar with the term CV because sometime back in the, in the group discussion, uh, he, he talked about CV. And this is where CV comes in in the Newton's equation. So Newton's gravitational constant has given a very powerful tool to, to bring together ether, matter, and the gravitational constant with velocities. So we are attributing length, time, mass to a velocity. You can't just say velocity in the, in the, in the uh, Gamma factor is just velocity. Velocity is distance upon time. What does that mean? To what uh, uh, matter or mass is that velocity attributed to? It's two masses. One is ether, one is matter. Now Feynman had said, it is in his, in his lecture at Caltech on ADC of energy units, it's too bad, I have already apologized. There's nothing else I can do. And they had not published this, and they thought it irrelevant when he said that, because they thought electron volts, joules, all these things are known. And he apologized repeatedly. So here it is, 511 keV for an electron. I divide it by elementary charge. I get volts V, 10 to the power 24, which is equal to C square upon R, which is the radius of, a, of an electron. So voltage is acceleration. So initially we said voltage is EMF, it's a force. Then they said, oh, it's potential difference. Then after that, uh, when, when students had a problem, the same repeated answers given, uh, think of a water tank at a higher level and a lower level, and water going downwards. And go read up, go read up in the library and, and, and figure it out. You need to study more. 
Well, I've shown for certain with an electron as a test particle that voltage is acceleration. Earlier, I'd shown that temperature is electron volts or EA, since voltage is acceleration. So here's another experimental evidence to depict the same. This is Wien's law for black body radiation. And here is Planck's law for black body radiation. So the question was, how did Planck and Wien have two different equations to depict the same, depict the same phenomenon? And I knew that there were two precessions. And so I applied the first precession over here to Wien's law. And lo and behold, I got T2, which is the temperature. And so I knew that temperature is indeed electron volts, or Ea. This is very powerful because all of enzymology, the entire uh, uh, replication of DNA, RNA, uh, is, is based on temperature. At three temperatures, we are able to run PCR machines and replicate DNA. So this temperature is actually putting in mass and changing things. And this is a pure experimental evidence using an electron as a test particle. That temperature is absolutely, and in fact, electron volts where voltage is acceleration. This slide depicts ether as the reason for magnetic flux. So the magnetic flux quantum is basically h upon 2e, where h is Planck's constant and e is elementary charge. And it can also be written as dA, where b is magnetic field. And magnetic field can be uh, depicted as i upon r, where i is current and r is the radius. So the radius of the ether particle is here. This is i. How I get this number is because I know that current squared is force. and so. I get I because the root of that will give me I. And I know A because I know R. And pi R squared times 137 is A. And when I plug in this value over here, I get the magnetic flux quantum. So the ether particle is also responsible for magnetism. Now here's the equation for current squared. So this is a simple experiment which was, which I have now put on the slide, which was discussed earlier by someone else, that if an electric current is passed through a, a, a conductor and a magnetic field is put perpendicular to that, not parallel, um, at, a, at a Tesla of 0.4, and that the length of the conductor is half a meter, then by convention, current is Tesla times distance which is 0.2 a, 0.2 amps. So this first line is by convention. So a current of 0.2 amps is generated when a magnetic field is impinging at 90, at 90 degrees on a half meter wire. Now we know that the force of gravity is mass times acceleration, 9.8 per kilogram, and that equals 0 0.0784 newtons. So this is convention, the first two. So I say, okay, let me now apply my theory where current square is force. So one current is, is 0.2 amps from here. The second current is 0.392, which is input into the wire to get levitation. So this is, these are both experimentally verifiable. And when you multiply the input current of 0.392 in a wire, and 0.2, which is generated by the field, you get 0 0.0784. So in other words, the force of gravity of 0 0.7, 0 0.0784 equals input current and current generated by a magnet. And so I've, sh I've shown here by a very simple experiment that current squared is force. Yeah,
putting a battery in Francis, that's, <laughs> 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 that's <laughs> talking so that's strongly, it, we have to put a battery in it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. They're protesting. Yeah, he's been draining, yeah. <laughs> now he's got, now he can move. Mm -hmm. Are we online? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Now, we know that the magnetic permeability is 4 pi 10 to the power minus 7 newtons per amp square. Now, if amp square is as current square is the same as force, these cancel out and you get a dimensional, dimensionless U naught. And that's very powerful. The reason why I'm using all of this is because it, it's leading to structure. So, n by amp meter square. square is actually dimensionless because current square equals force. And that angle I have depicted here as a solid angle. And it is this angle through which your vortices, your vortex, your, your, your uh, magnetic uh, fields are generated as, uh, as the material particles move around in the steroid. So over here, I've just said what Feynman said. It's too bad. I've, I have apologized. There's nothing else I can do. And this is about the units of energy. Now here is the unification. So if mass times radius is charge square, this is the equation for a pendulum time period of, of, of a pendulum length of string and Earth's gravity. And this is charge square, force is I square, and you get Q is equal to IT. So it's very simple. That the, that the pendulum experiment, which is based on gravity, converts into Q equals to IT simply because ML is charge square and MG is force, which is I square. And so I brought together electromagnetism and gravity and unified it. Black holes, so this is Schwarzschild's radius, 2 gm by C square. What I've done is I've taken the electron as a test particle with the ether constant ratio that this is so many ether, uh, ether masses per, per radial meter, and I get the, sh the, the Schwarzschild radius for a black hole. So basically, I've shown this as an example that matter, in this case an electron, turns back to ether, and that's the reason for the, the involution of matter to ether and the evolution of ether to matter. Now here's the final diagram which tells, uh, tells us the whole story. I start with the graviton here. There are two gravitons. It's a twin mass. 10 to the power 7 makes an iteron. And then a frequency of 10 to the power 23 makes a proton. And then a frequency of 10 to the power 18 gives 186 ether again, which is elementary charge. And so through this motion from a graviton of 10 to the power minus 58, a twin mass, to an iteron to a proton to elementary charge have shown the evolution of matter from ether. The graviton is at faster than light speed of 3.48 times 10 to the power 12. And when it goes through two, two precessions, it goes to slow speed of 25812.8076 uh, meters per, uh, per second. The product of that gives C square. So I've shown that here, F1 times F2 times F3, that's 10 to the power 7, 10 to the power 23, 10 to the power 18, giving 10 to the power 48. And E equals H, F2 is for a proton. So this frequency, as depicted by E is equal to HF equals mc square, is experimental. This is experimental. This is experimental because this last number gives the wavelength of the Compton wavelength of a proton. So everything is experimental in, in this diagram. The same diagram is depicted over here in numbers. So here's a simplification of atomic mass at a frequency going around an ether torus. Many tori make a toroid, and this toroid is wavelength. Absolutely measurable. Each ring is measurable. The circumference measurable. The circumference is the wavelength. C squared faster than light times slow light. MV 
R times E equals H, that's the Broglie equation. 1 in 60, the faster than light at this length gives H, where Q is the Boltzmann's constant. This is the slow light equation, which is a pre, uh, the precession going this way. The faster than light is longitudinal light. This is the transverse wave. Here I've depicted the same thing in terms of charge square, in terms of, of De Broglie's equation. The nice thing about depicting it this way is you can get the Coulomb's constant, because the Coulomb's constant is, is the product of these two velocities. In other words, there are those four rings. The first ring becomes the second ring by 10 to the power 7. So that's the hydron. So the hydron to the elementary charge is Coulomb's constant. Whereas from ether to, to the elementary charge, starting from the graviton, gives the C square. I pulled this off the net because it was a very close depiction of what I'm trying to depict. I'll have a, next year a, a nice computerized graphic of explaining all these terms. Um, but this is what uh, matter would look like with, uh, with um, the hydrons here. And this is the ether toroid. There are vortices all over the place. There's a black hole in the middle. Okay, we have some questions. We have some time for questions. mechanics of what occurs in uh, the gravitational process. What causes the Earth to move toward the sun, for example, physically? How's it, how's it accomplished? Do you have something like that? Uh, well, all my work has been based on the uh, proton, the hydrogen atom, uh, the electron, then how how uh, the Rydberg photon forms from that, uh, which is the 13.6 electron volts, which goes in. I am not uh, well versed with cosmology and the, and the stars, so I've not gone beyond that. But if I were to, to extrapolate this idea, since the galactic and the, and the atomic work the same way, I would think that myriads of ether particles are there in outer space, the graviton, which is moving at two speeds, and giving C square, and that, that the, the, the two precessions cause angular momentum, uh, 2 pi times 10 to the power minus 7 times 137, which is a measurable amount. It's there in all the equations. And those precessions magnify over distances, giving angular momentum. And that would cause things to move. Would you repeat your value uh, slowly for the for the uh, uh, yeah? Could you repeat slowly your uh, uh, figure for the pressure of the ether? Um, I square, which is force, divided by R one times R two, which is area. Yeah, but I'm I'm, I'm looking at, since pressure is uh, say. Uh, in units of newtons per uh, square meter, yes. or uh, dynes perhaps per square centimeter. Yes. If, if you uh, say for uh, outer space, uh, have an estimate for the uh, typical pressure uh, in intergalactic space, in other words, far away. It would depend on the two eyes that are involved. So that's where the beauty of this equation comes in. You can measure pressure by measuring electric current. So if you knew I1 and I2, uh, and you knew the temperature at that point, uh, because the temperature determines R1 and R2. How that happens is in my paper, uh, the solution to the Boltzmann constant. So you would get R1 and R2, provided you, you knew the temperature at that point, the Kelvin temperature, and uh, the I1 and I2, the current 
that is passing through those legs. Okay, now I, I imagine that you're, you're in, I'm gonna ask another question, but I think it, it ties right into your answer of the first question. It, I was gonna ask for a, a density uh, of estimate of, uh, uh, in, in terms of, uh, say, uh, kilograms per cubic meter, but I think that would depend upon uh, the, the currents that you just described and so on. Is I have not worked out the density of ether, but I know the method to do it. The method would be this. Density is mass upon volume. So the old way of measuring mass is by comparison with a platinum iridium alloy, which is defined as one kilogram. The new way of defining one kilogram is the inverse of Avogadro's number, which is 6.022, times um, 10 to the power 23, uh, 10 to the power 26, because that's per kilogram, 23 is per gram. So the inverse of that gives one atomic mass unit, which, they, which some uh, people in SI consider, System International consider as one kilogram. So by counting atoms in cesium, they are doing that. I have a better way of counting atoms, uh, the material universe, um, because I've, since I knew that voltage is acceleration, current squared is force, electrical resistance turns out to be I upon M or V upon E, where I is current and M is mass. And it's a constant, 1.87 10 to the power 27 kilograms per, uh, I mean, uh, um, amps per kilogram. So if we know in a pure, uh, a pure substance, without any isotopes, if we know the current and we know the mass of the isotope, we know it's electrical resistance. We can count it because there will be n number of atoms in, in a given substance. From that, we can know uh, what one kilogram is for cheap. So we're spending millions of dollars counting season atoms with lasers. So we know how much matters can contained in the four toroids that I showed you. So we know that volume of ether is constant. And that's why Avogadro's number is so powerful. We teach it in school. And I could never answer students' questions. Why does hydrogen, nitrogen, or water as gases occupy the same volume? The answer is that the toroidal volume is the same. And so the, the oscillations that are taking place, which is a measure of mass, the frequency of that, which is C squared, which is different from the two masses, which gives the V square of the hydrogen molecule shown on another slide. So the density can be known because we now know the volume through the four toroids, and we know we know the mass by using um, the my formula for electrical resistance. We can work out the density, but I haven't done it, but it won't be a problem. Maybe one last question, and that is uh, uh, with regard to uh, spin, say, uh, uh, electron spin or uh, maybe a proton spin, uh, uh, do, uh, do you believe that uh, these, that basically that, that, uh, that physically something like spinning really uh, goes on or do you think that that is just a uh, an indirect uh, interpretation of uh, something else? Well, 2 pi times 10 to the power minus 7 times 137 is angular, is, 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 is an angle. Yeah. And if you look at, uh, look at it in three dimension, it's 4 pi times 10 to the power minus 7, as in the case of U naught, which is magnetic permeability, which I consider as dimensionless. So when you have when you have two terms that depict angle, obviously something is moving with angular momentum. And then the 10 to the power 7, which is the, the graviton aggregation to itheron, is the movement from ether to matter, 10 to the power 7. And that 10 to the power 7 if it gets multiplied into 4 pi times 10 to the power minus 7 or, or 2 pi times 10 to the power minus 7 that 10 to the power 7 cancels out with minus 7 and you get a full rotation. And so spin is a reality. Everything is turning. And as pointed out earlier, everything is a, is a helix 
thought waves, protein, carbohydrates, everything is a helix. So it extrapolates to life. Um, in your but, uh, give him a microphone, please. If someone else has a question too, we need microphones. We have people who are watching online that can't hear you. And please, if you do want to have a question, get your microphone ready. Yes, I have a mic now. Uh, in your lecture, there was a point where you had uh, force over area. Yes. And uh, I wonder whether you could give a simple definition of force. Force is current squared. Current, electric current, I, is mv divided by E, where M is mass of an atom or an ion, V is its velocity, where V is R upon T, where R is charge square equals MR, charge square is known, M is known, R is the determined amount, T is the time taken for it to discharge under that electric current at a cathode, if it's a cation, and um, E is elementary charge, 1.6021765, times 10 to the power 9, minus 19 coulombs. So that current squared, where one current is measured by these uh, parameters, is force. In terms of, if you take away the electrical properties of that mass, which is ether, which starts out as a graviton and ends up as elementary charge, um, and you put in the acceleration due to ether of the earth, which is mg, uh, which is g, then the mass times g also equals force. In both cases, ether is involved. But without the uh, mathematics, uh, could you give just a uh, common definition of what force is? It is, this is my principle, that um, it is good to have text, it is good to have descriptors, but those descriptors have to be defined by mathematics, which are attributes of real physical entities which you have to define. Otherwise, each it's up to individual interpretation as to what that text means, and it creates more confusion, not that it is, it is uh, not allowed. It is allowed. That's that is how how people talk to each other without math. But it creates a variation in understanding. But when you say, for instance, the wavelength of light is 600 nanometers, we know what we are talking about. We're rather saying that it is somewhere between green and yellow. So force, yes, by the old definition, force divided by acceleration is a definition of mass. But then, uh, as I've shown, acceleration is caused by two masses. That understanding doesn't come unless you look at an equation. Thank you. Yes. Uh, this transformation of ether to matter is certainly very, very interesting. Can you, can you use it to explain emission of radiation from matter, for example, discrete, disc, the discrete frequencies of emission from hydrogen gas. Yes, in fact, that was the slide for for the Wittberg photon, where Feynman shows um, and says, and he draws it on his car about um, how an electron can absorb and emit mat uh, uh, matter. So I've shown that that C divided by 137 is V, and then C squared minus, the, the gamma factor turns out to be a certain factor, which when multiplied by the electron mass gives another mass, you subtract that and you get two Rydberg photons. So the one Rydberg photon is 13.6 electron volts. So that's the first ionization energy of a hydrogen atom. So when 13.6 electron volts are impinged as ionization energy, you're impinging basically mass equivalence energy of one Rydberg photon. Now why one Rydberg photon works and not two? Because the gamma factor gives a result for two 
um, Rydberg photons. And that's because the electron is stopped to zero velocity, and that gives the half mv square of the emergent electron. So the half mv square is because you're averaging out under constant acceleration the, the, the throwing out of an electron. So mc square equals half mv square. And that is why an electron which is under normal circumstances 511 kilo electron volts at this kinetic energy, it's 13.6 electron volts, equivalent to the input Rydberg photon mass equivalent energy of 13.6. We have a question from the live feed, and uh, Pal asks if ether has pressure, and why is it we can feel air pressure and the Earth's gravitational attraction, but not the ether pressure? Likewise, I can feel the velocity of wind but not the velocity of ether. What gives? Well, the, the pressure of atmosphere is entwined with the pressure of ether because you have matter moving inside the tubes of ether. And that's why we have stable orbits in atoms because the stable or, uh, orbits are basically the, the material, in this case, in the proton, moving in a tunnel of of ether tori, which forms the toroid. So when we are feeling air pressure, and, and I've explained that in the paper uh, on the Boltzmann constant, where exactly worked out the, the, uh, the atmospheric pressure due to ether at 300 Kelvin, which is like room temperature. Right? So that's one thing. And when you think about it philosophically, as you said, can you explain what force is? in layman's terms. I can explain what ether is in layman's terms. If you hold two north poles of a magnet, you get that repulsive force. That repulsive force, which people call field, etc., is nothing but ether. You can feel the ether with two magnets. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.